moving right along, um, testing. So moving right along, uh, I do want to go into kind of a C part of looking at the params, and we're going to focus on some inputs and utilities that I find very helpful. But uh, one thing I want to do first, and what I've brought in here, and I'm going to go into detail, uh, uh, keeping in mind of our uh, panels we can use and our brand viewers and the trees that we can view through that, and uh, draw, and, and then applying that to a few things. I'm going to look at number sliders and then, of course, bring in a couple of these primitive containers under integer and number. And uh, I, I would like to slowly have us make a change as I go through this class into the icons, as I display icons, and I maybe end up doing that. But uh, one thing I haven't shown you right now is uh, three little tricks, and I just want to show you very fast, that if you input something in by dragging it in, it'll override the other one. So if you input that one in, it'll bounce it out. All you have to do is hold down Shift, and you can connect it. And then some people say, well, how do I disconnect? Well, you can right-click, and you can go into uh, Disconnect, and then you have to choose which one you want to disconnect. It's best to just hold down Control and drag back the thing you want to disconnect. And you can see that there's a minus with the red sign there, so you drag it back. And another nice tool is if this two is in here, so I want to connect them both with the Shift plus, so just hold the Shift, and there's the green plus sign. I can hold down Control shift and pull out all both of those and shove them into here, and it'll override the other one. And because it was already there, it seemed to have bounced out. So let's try that one more time. Control, disconnect this one. Let's put this into here. Hold down Shift and reconnect here. Let's hit Control, Shift, pull out both of them and stick them into there. Now, I think what's happening is because it's brand viewer, it will only take, for some reason, it won't take them both, which is fairly interesting. Let me just try and put that one in with the Shift. I guess brand viewers won't take double data, but I certainly can take this and pull it into here. So if we wanted to, let me just show you an example of that. Control, Shift, pull this out and stick it into there. and They'll both move up to there. And uh, same thing, bring it back down. And uh, I just want to try something for a second. No, nope. uh, information can come up uh, if you actually want to hold down uh, the Alt, find out what's going on as well. Anyway, just playing around a little bit here, but I want to get you connecting and disconnecting. It'd be a real frustration if nobody goes over and shows you those little tool trips. Now, like I said, I am going to go into details with number sliders, but I want to show you instead of these nodes unapplied, let's go back to something we had in the last uh, session, which was just you know 55 minutes ago. Um, we did produce a box. I think that was fairly interesting. So what I'm going to show you is how to produce a box is I'm going to pull it into a, a, a geometry because I want to get you in the habit of just assuming you're working with a geometry. And you can just take that. And now we have two boxes. We actually have the one that was over there. We're going to bring this one over and have a little peek at it and see what we can do with it. <clears throat> and uh, what's nice is grab your panel and just double check that you got a box. And of course, we have a box there. Now, what could you do to a box? And what's happening here is I'm getting all of this other geometry that's baked in there. So I'm going to hit it here and hit Preview Off. And all that's going to remain is the geometry that I actually brought over here is this box. So this box is here, but it also sits here as another box over here. And it's just not on Preview. So try to understand that I'm making copies whenever I'm doing stuff like that, running a script to another one. You can also use what's called a Relay Tool and double tap here and pull out this information and put it into something else. So a little Control Shift, you've got another box. And there you go, you can, uh, I'm just going to do a quick disconnect, but I'll show you how those relays, by double clicking, they pop on here, and then I can relay that information over to exactly that, just like running a race and running a relay. So I have one box and another box. Now I only need one, so I really don't need that relay, so I'm going to take it off. So what I'm going to do to this box is, what could I do with it? I'm going to use a little bit of a surface edit tool called a deconstruct rep, a boundary representation. It's going to end up giving me a face, all the faces, which if we take a look at the data now, you'll see that in those faces, we'll get further into this, you will have a bunch of untrimmed surfaces, which are listed 0 through 5 because we start counting at 0. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 faces. We also have edges. And of course, you have a lot more edges because think about a cube and how many edges are involved. You have 12. So you have 0 through 11 line-like edges, line-like curves. And then you have vertices. And how many vertices are there? And you see there's a list of data coming here. And whenever it gets jumbled like that, just stretch it out and you'll see that you have 8 vertices that are making up that uh, cube. So that's just something to think about, but there's a way to get power. Now, take a look at how that box is actually created from vertices. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells me as I go farther along, and I'm going to jump ahead in the vectors, which I was talking about last time, is creating a point, and I basically want to be able to make a point. And uh, one point out of all those eight points is interesting to think about how I would do that. So I could take these points, and this is fairly interesting, and I'm going to try and play with this so you wrap your head around this. That point which defaults to 0, 0, 0, I could have control over what that is. And what I'm going to defer now is to go, and we're going to jump back to that, but I want to show you something kind of exciting with this, is these number sliders work 
by having a look at what they slide from. This is an integer value 0 through 10. And this is a uh, float value with two decimal points from 0 0.000 to 0 point, uh, three decimal points to 1.000. And those are numbers. So technically, you can actually run those in. If I ran that into the x, y, z, now I've changed that point that was running at, at, uh, at, at this point coordinate, uh, x, y, z number, um, into, and I think what I have going on here, and what I'm going to do is just jump over to display icons, because they actually read icons better or floats. And since it's so small, it's hard to notice what's actually happening here. <laughs> it's moving with such a microscopic level as a point, it's not interesting enough. So what I'm going to do is actually, what I'll show you is I'll disconnect this one, because I don't need that data with control shift away from the pram viewer. Control shift, and we'll apply plugging them all into here. And now we have a point system that we can start to bring out and have a little more control of. And that's moving on the x, y, z. And I'm controlling a parametric point with a slider. That's an integer slider from 0 to 10. But what I want to show you, fairly interesting, is these eight points that make up this box, I could start substituting other points to actually create another box. Which is, if you think of that, what is that box but a series of vertices with edges and faces? So that's how I really want to come at solids, is I do not want to come at dealing with a box that I've imported from Rhino. I actually want to create geometries from the point attributes that may end up making up a geometry. So if I had that one, and I just quickly copied that three times, and actually probably more so than copy it, it might be interesting just to take that point and go to a move function and move it in one direction and another function, and I could end up building a geometry like a triangle from that. So that's a lot said, but that's really how I come at surfaces, is try to dissect them down the curves and points and then the attributes that go to those points. So maybe without dwelling too much on that to start, because we'll get into that as we move further ahead, let's talk about the uh, inputs uh, that I wanted to talk about in params uh, and the utilities that I'm using. And I've only chosen a few. One of the most powerful tools that's here uh, as we take a look at things um, is the number slider. And so a number slider can be produced very easily, and I haven't talked about this yet. You just double click on the page, and immediately it can start finding keywords like circle, and it'll go to the most recent things that you've typed because it has a memory of what you've actually done. And there's a profiler down here, uh, which is very interesting on display canvas widgets. And you can look at your profiler, uh, see how much energy is going to each one. The markup will tell you what you've used later. There's a compass, there's a line, and there's message. Uh, uh, balloons that can come up, be toggled on and off. This will recall your latest functions that you're using. So I'm going to double click and to get your head around number sliders, which may become important, important for uh, making points. Uh, let's just double click and let's type the number one and see what happens. Well, we get a Boolean kind of value of zero and one, true or false. That's an integer value. And we can change that by going in and editing it and going in and then being very particular. So a lot of people waste their time, in my opinion, coming in and sliding one of these in and having it default to 0 to 10, uh, 1.000 with three decimal points. That's a way to start, and then you're going in and you're editing, uh, whether it's a rational number, a natural, uh, an, uh, 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 what am I, integer, and always throws me, uh, an even number or an odd number, and then you have the ability to set your uh, maximum and minimum value, the range between it will, will tell you, and then you can adjust the value of it by here. But since it's an integer value, if I switch it over the rational value, it's going to default to three decimal places. I can change that to two, and you can see I can slide array and apply that to the number slider. And now I've changed that number slider to what it was, and there it is. So, but that's, that's the long way about it, and I don't do that. So if I want a number slider zero to one, I'll just type one. I'm going to double click again and type 1.00. And now I've got a number slider with two decimal places that'll go all the way up to 1. Another example is if you go in and hit 2, it's going to choose an integer value between 0 and 10. Uh, and that's a nice little tool. But if you type 2.00, you're going to get an inter you're going to get a float value or a double value or whatever you want to call it, a decimal value, two decimal places that'll slide around. And that's a nice tool to do. And then the same thing for numbers like 12. It will balance between 1 and uh, all the way up to 100. Uh, 0 all the way up to 100, and if you typed in 12.00, you're going to get two decimal places from 0 up to 100. It kind of continues that way. There are other techniques, and these are nice little tools for organizing your script. Uh, you could go in and type things like, I want to go from 1.23, and then 2 is uh, symbolic of dot dot. And so I want to take that up to 6.89. I don't know why you want a number slider like that, but that's a two, two decimal place number slider from 1.23 all the way up to 6.89. 
eight nine. And you can also go in there and type some functions like one uh, less than the number you want it to be three point four uh, five to one decimal place, which is less than nine. And that's going to be interesting. You put an integer in, a float, and an integer. I think it's going to override to a double or a float, and there you go. You're set at 3.5 between 1 and 9, and it moved the uh, integer values up to a uh, float value to one decimal place. So that's just something to think about and a way to handle that. Number sliders are powerful, powerful tools, and you'll end up using those to generate points. So if we went in there and we said, okay, I wanted to go in there to my vector tool and create my old points, which will direct my geometry. I'll take a 1, I'll take a 4, and I'll take 5, and there's one point. Um, I'll default to a point that's just 0, 0, 0, which is there. And we had that other point that was kicking around here, which is kind of nice. And what I would say is just grab yourself a little point container, pull that into here, and now we have three points that I could very quickly do some interesting geometries on. And this is getting a little head into curves. There's a nice line tool. So what happens if I make that the end point? Actually, I should probably make that the start point. Make that the end point. I have a line from here to here. If I copy that twice, uh, you can see exactly how I'm starting to build geometry. So this is where it ends up being fun. I'm going to take that point and that point, and then I'm going to take this point and this point. And technically, I have a, what did I mess up? One, <laughs> one, two, and I did the same one twice. So I need to pull this one into here. And there we go. There's our triangle uh, that's been generated by three points. And I've got a pretty cool thing that then you can start going to tools like surface and slow your script down by building a boundary surface around all of those edges. And that may not work um, because that's not really how the tool works, but I'm going to try and import all three of those. And there we go, it did. So sometimes the nodes really have their own defaults. And I've made a surface that's now extrudable. Uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to show you the power of number sliders. Uh, let's make it extrudable. It's going to default in a direction to, let's say... Uh, a vector which we'll talk about later. Let's make it the x uh, unit vector uh, x direction. And there we go. We have a little offset extrusion that's building a solid for us. If I pop this into standard, zoom extends all, and that's going to give me everything on the plate, which is not really what I want. And it's a pretty big object there, but you can see right there, a little hard to navigate because I'm not just <laughs> zooming on that one object. Let me grab a, a zoom target, and there we go. Grab that, and there we go. Got a nice zoom that I can rotate. And I, I moved it in the X direction, which isn't really the best vector to pull that off into. It might help that if I took a Y vector, uh, saw which direction that will, it will pull it in the other way and I'll have another shape that actually makes it a little thicker. And you built a geometry here that now, if you bake that, you've produced from points and number sliders a certain type of geometry that you can move in Rhino and bake it and you've actually created something. So I'm going to jump in there and go to rendered uh, to shade it and you'll see exactly what I ended up making. And you could create that in Rhino, but once again, this is interesting because you come back to the point attributes, you understand how to make number sliders, and as you change those number sliders, you have parametric control over where that triangle goes. So it's the power of number sliders, and I just want to throw that in there for fun. The other tool is I'm showing you the uh, basically uh, all the points I could go back into as a pram tool and see what I have here. Obviously, I have an extruded one branch with one item, which tends to be, if I went in and analyzed it through my panel tool, it will say... Uh, uh, close brep, uh, which is once again something that I could debrep, and it brings you back full circle to what I was doing back here, which was debrepping what I had to find the edges, the front, and uh, this is where you kind of have the cyclical game of learning, researching, developing, creating, and then the cycle back again. So there's our brep uh, dividing down the faces, which are our containers of surfaces we talked about, and there they are, and we also have the ability to pull edges out in a sense of curves. And there's our edges, and you see they've gone green. So there's our surfaces, there's our edges, and our vertices can be put into a point container uh, as points. But you, of course, put any of these into geometries. So there you go. You've made something, and you've taken it apart, and you've started to analyze it. And that's all dependent on some number sliders that you're starting to gain control of. What's nice is when we take a look at an object like this, excuse me, as we take a look at an object like this, and say we're dealing with this, if you're into animation and you want to see the power of the number slider, it can bake you a bunch of different forms as we change this. So if I took an amplification vector here and went in the Y direction, let's say 2, uh, which will give me 0 to 10, I can put that in and now I can control the thickness of that uh, and start to extrude out that form. But number sliders have this really nice ability to right-click on it and hit animate. And I'm just going to choose 
uh, six, uh, let's choose 12 frames and hit go and you'll see this object animates itself and makes a little animation for me. And that basically baked that into a uh, folder on my desktop of all these little tiny images of that moving out. So there's your first animation with number sliders, a wonderful tool to play around with and I suggest doing it. We'll do that at the end of this session. We're at 15 minutes, so let's keep rolling. Uh, a lot of information. The other thing I want to show you is the container for a Boolean, which was fairly interesting and I'll go back, I guess, for drawing full names. Uh, even though we could indicate these in a boolean as you see it, it can go from uh, true to false and that's very good information for you to know and what that means false and true will be symbolic by zero and one so you'll end up using that um, and you'll use that in dispatch items and in patterns and masks and all this wonderful stuff uh, to choose things and there's another little quick tool in here that I didn't spend any time on it's a button which is very similar and allows you to hold down whether you want it to be true or not so you can activate something temporarily while you're working don't know if I have time now, but I'll keep going. One of my favorite tools is the uh, is the uh, uh, MD slider, which is fairly similar to sliding a point along a curve, but it's a multi-dimensional slider in uh, two directions. So let's take something we have before that we were playing with, and we definitely had a surface, and I will go in here and I will grab an additional surface. I might grab a geometry, but I'll grab another surface and slide it way over here, which is nice, just gain control over this. And what I'm going to do is take that surface and I'm going to do something called reparametize, which sets it from 0 to 1 to 0 to 1. The reason I did that is the default on this is I double click. It's set from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 in the XYZ. Uh, Z domain is 0 to 1, but it's not really counting because it's a 2D domain. So I can plug this in to the surface if I was to evaluate surface, which is a nice little tool. So let's jump in here and say mm, evaluate surface. I've been playing around so much with GH Python nodes and uh, C Sharp nodes and C programming and Python programming that I'm starting to lose my edge when it comes to Grasshopper. If I evaluate to a point that surface that's reparametized, let's grab that surface, which is going back to this beautiful one we made, uh, the nice big juicy one. And as we take a look at the surface on that surface, is watch what happens after I've reparametized it and I start to slide around in that slider. I have full capacity to go to any point on that slider and do whatever I want with it. So I could definitely take the point that I'm working with, which is giving me, we'll talk about normal values, UV direction later in the frame, but we could take something to build like a sphere and uh, get into solids, put that on the base and pop the radius in there as, some, as, a, as a number that's actually quite visible because it's a very large object. And now you have slider control to move that sphere through any area of that surface, which is a very nice tool. So the multi-dimensional slider is pretty amazing. The two other tools that I should show, and I'm going to save the graph mapper for another one because it's an issue in itself, is an optimization tool of a, a gene pool. It's kind of like when you click on it, a bunch of number sliders. So as you right-click and hit edit, you'll notice that it's set to 10 as a default. So let's just bring that down to something like 5, which is nice and reasonable. Let's set the decimal count to, uh, to one decimal count. And... Let's uh, take the value, uh, I, I should have wait, waited there for a second, uh, the maximum value, let's take the maximum value up to 10 and bring that back down to 0, okay. So it's a 10, and now you'll see it goes from 0 with one decimal place up to 10. Now what you can do with this is you can randomize and have that data coming in as a list uh, into a multitude of things. So very interesting to think back to our point system. Let's say we had that point system that was working. Uh, with, say, these two points. And it's hard for me to see this again when I get off display because I'm so used to seeing icons. And we'll become accustomed to that. Let's take two of these points and bring them down here. And what might, might be best is if I just grab a pram and take that data here and uh, cut and paste that and take the data from this point here. So you start to build the spaghetti, of wor uh, the spaghetti uh, or noodles, or can of worms. Uh, these two points plus... Uh, this sphere, uh, sorry, we're not doing the sphere, we're doing the, these param items. Um, we could have those two points that have been generated, and then we could take this point and copy it again, and I'm going to bring it down here, but I'm going to take the Z attribute and allow it to be all of these points in here. And before I set all these points to it, I'm going to right-click and I'm going to set randomize. Now I got a bunch of different points, and I could go and randomize that by 10%. I could randomize that by 100% again. I'm going to pull that list of points into the Z coordinate. But what ends up happening as we look at it is it produces a variety. It produces a list of points that have many Z coordinates. So 
you're starting to think, what have I made? Well, I didn't just make one point then because I have multiple Z coordinates. I've actually produced five starting to count to zero as five points. Now, all those points can actually be very playful in bringing in and building the same triangle system that we had before. So one, two, three points I could do things with. And it would, it, because I'm using a list of points here, it gets fairly interesting. So as I go in to curve and start to make a line between these two, that's fairly straightforward. That makes sense to us. But uh, let me take off everything else but what we're clicking on. Um, if you take a look at all these points along with this point, and what might help is that I grab all these items. Ah, oh, it'll be fine. Um, basically, if I start to take this point and build a line between that point and the list of points, and remember not to pull your data out at the end of the, uh, the pram viewer, you're going to see that all of a sudden we have five points, which is fairly interesting. And then when I generate it again and take this top point, you see we have all uh, this list of points to that initial one, which is actually the same point. So hang on one second. This one is start to those ends. This is to those uh, points there. I'm just having a look at what I'm making. I'm kind of making similar points. It's not going to play off of uh, very well. And all those points are going to be connected to this point being one there. And just let me hit shift to see what the other ones are. They're all lined up, so it's not going to work in that direction. I'll probably have to uh, produce another point to make something interesting. This point is down here. Uh, just let me try something here for a second. Thinking of all these wonderful lines that are coming out of here and all these points that are out of here. And I'm just uh, I'm playing around with the idea of where those points are, the points I want to go to. The end point wouldn't be very interesting. That's probably the most interesting point system. That's the one that goes top to bottom. And you can see we're starting to build something a little different with what we're doing. And I don't think I need that double one there. So I'm just actually going to grab these two and you'll see we have some interesting geometries that are being made. And then if we did something like brought those together or used a simple surface tool to pipe, uh, I could bring in those objects, uh, not only with that, but with another shift, that list. And you see I brought in these pipes. I'll take my number slider from 1.00, or 1.0, and that will allow me to make the, the pipes much smaller to appreciate the size. And now we're starting to build some interesting geometry that actually have some shape. And all you have to do here is hover over caps and see that it says uh, zero for no cap, one for flat cap, and two for round cap. And a little technique I want to show you right now is double click instead of typing in a number slider, type in quotes, and then type in a digit, and it will default to a panel that you actually start to get data on there. And we'll talk about the panel tool in a minute because sometimes you need the panel tool set to uh, multi-line data and sometimes multi-line data taken off. But this understands that. And we actually put a little round cap on the end of each one of these, which makes it kind of sweet. And you'll kind of see that evidence when I do that. If I double click again and hit quote and one, uh, then I have a nice little one slider I can pop in and then you see that's gone to flat. And this is just an idea of fabrication of what might happen. And, and then again, if I baked and didn't group, uh, into Rhino, then I'd have the ability to have these poles, uh, this poly surface I can move out. I have other ones that were built here, so I can take that one out. This one I can play with on this side, I can scale differently, I can take it apart. If I click this off, you'll see exactly, uh, actually I should say on and not click here, you'll see we're only looking at nothing ghosted, but the geometries we're building in Rhino. So I think it's get complex pretty fast, and that's just the gene pool tool. And if you don't think that's confusing enough, and exciting enough to start playing with Grasshopper and building geometries and wrapping your heads around this, we're only in Param, so we don't even dare to get into plugins. Things get complex very quickly. Find out the tools you like using. Find out the details of each of these very key popular tools. And even though I'm showing a lot that may seem chaotic, it's just from practice. And I'm not, you know, I've only been doing it a year and a half. Um, but I've come to understand these basic tools that... It's not about what exactly is happening geometry in the Rhino wind port, uh, uh, viewport. It's about the geometries that are driven by the information. And I'll use the example of a sphere that possibly nobody's seeing the circles making that up, let alone the radius or the center or the number uh, length of that radius. But my mind's more focused on, on that than the outcome that you're experiencing something like if I took all of this geometry and turned it to preview on, uh, you may end up seeing this final outcome of that sphere on there, but I'm really driving the force with my own mind. I'm just going to delete that because the only objects I really wanted to keep were the ones that I had buried earlier. And we've made a pretty simple system, uh, and I'll show you how it becomes more and more interesting mathematically as we start to play off of uh, uh, different things. Uh, where's our little, and these are the baked forms that are in there. 
uh, or the forms I started with, so they're not the ghosted forms. And here's all the ghosted forms that are in there. And if I want to see something selected, I'll show you a quick little idea. It turns green. You can go up here to preferences, and just like in Rhino, what I like to do is go down to my colors, uh, my viewport, and I like to set my colors a little different. That when I select something, it turns a beautiful blue, uh, because I like blue, and it retains a kind of orange quality uh, to what I haven't selected. So not too ugly, but a orange and blue kind of stands out, or yellow and blue stands out. And now you can see that when I'm looking at something and I want to select a unique thing. I can say, well, there's the sphere I'm playing with. Let's go back to that number, uh, multi-dimensional slider and play with that geometrically as I change things. Keep in mind, everything else is also dependent on making visible things like this and then going in and changing your number and updating your code and script. So you can pull that this way, and then all of a sudden, everything else has to update to it. And there's that second box that was there underneath the other one because it's still dependent on the original. So fun, playful things, a few nodes picking through the params, I will end with a little bit of the graph mapper, but I think the graph mapper is a great tool that as you start getting into it, even though it's not very exciting when you load it up, uh, when you load it up, you're going to find a graph mapper that looks empty. And then when you right click on it, you can change your graph type and start playing in a huge series. And I know the work in process for Windows and also Windows 7 coming out, uh, sorry, uh, Rhino 7 is going to be very exciting uh, for the types of graphs that you can bring in here, a parabola. And then you have total control over moving that. You can actually double click and go into setting domains and ranges of what's happening there. So we're going to start using that as we dive into one of my most favorite categories. And it is the math. So we're going to generate some pretty awesome, fantastic shapes and forms using that in our next section. Another 30 minutes. We'll take a break for uh, five minutes. And we'll go back in for another hour on these tools as you become more proficient with Grasshopper for Rhino. Thanks for watching.